ladies and gentlemen. Welcome and thank you for joining today's Hot Shot, Mental Health Matters, Supporting Students for a Safe Return to School. Before we begin, please ensure that you have opened the WebEx chat panel by using the associated icons located at the bottom right side of your screen. Please note all audio connections are currently muted and this conference is being recorded. You are welcome to submit written questions throughout the presentation, which will be addressed at the Q&A session of the webinar. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in your chat panel, then enter your question in the message box provided and send. If you require technical assistance, please send the chat to the event producer. With that, I will turn the webinar over to Jason Amihaji. Jason, please go ahead. Thanks so much, Michelle, and thanks to everyone for joining us today for this very special Hot Shot webinar in our summer series. Uh, we're going to kick it off. I'm very um, honored to introduce our division director, Jamie Brown, uh, from the Office of Public and Indian Housing. Great. Thanks, Jason. And good afternoon or good morning to folks, depending on where you are. We really appreciate you tuning in to this uh, webinar. Um, we are focused on the safe return to school after 18 months of the pandemic. Uh, as you all know, schools are really important for social and emotional development, but given the fact that we've all been in the pandemic and there's some uncertainty about the future, um, we can all empathize with the feelings of anxiety and confusion that some of kids may face. And um, this webinar is really focused on encouraging you all um, to develop tools and resources and um, hear from some existing communities about what they're doing. Um, as you know, mental health is uh, more important now than ever. Um, and we've really brought in some great folks representing public housing authorities in Covington, Lynn, and Norfolk uh, to share some of the work that they've been doing. And we hope that their work serves as idea starters for you um, and to bring back to your community and encourage and empower your youth. Um, this is really part of our HUD Strong Families Fall effort. I know some of you are HUD Strong Families veterans and are very familiar with the work that we do in the summer. Um, but we are also working um, this fall to expand it uh, for back-to-school efforts because we know how important that is. And our focus really is on youth and empowering youth. Um, this webinar, again, we have uh, our partners from PHA. Uh, we also have a representative uh, from SAMHSA here who will uh, share insights with you. Um, uh, but we will also next week have uh, a webinar on the Delta variant. I know a lot of folks have been asking questions, you know, how is it different than um, regular COVID-19? So we're going to really dig deep into that, um, as well as cover the more recent announcement that uh, came out this uh, today about uh, booster shots. Um, and then on September 24th, uh, I'm sorry, September 1st, we'll be talking about youth vaccination specifically, um, where you all can get more information about youth. As you know, youth are kind of the lagging population, given the fact that they're some of the last folks to be eligible for vaccines. Um, and so I know that there's still some surrounding questions with that, and we'll tackle that on September 1st. Um, as always, I encourage you all to read the bulletins. We put a lot of time, attention, and care into those. Um, and, uh, to, you know, to keep you updated on what we're doing, to see some of the highlights from your peers at other sites, um, uh, they're all, you know, encapsulated in the bulletin, as well as some of our past webinars. So please sign up for that if you aren't already uh, signed up uh, for that bulletin. Um, before I turn it back over to Jason, I just wanted to give a uh, thank you to him. Uh, and the work that he's done on all of these COVID efforts and bringing you all these hot shots, as well as thanking our uh, Office of Field Policy and Management, uh, in particular, um, Romel Calderwood. Um, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Jason. 
Great. Thanks so much, Jamie, and thanks again to everyone for being here with us today. So without further ado, I'm really honored to hand it over to uh, Rob from SAMHSA. You're going to hear a little bit about what SAMHSA does, if you're not already familiar with them, um, and also some of the context that they're seeing on a, on a national level um, around mental health and mental health for youth, and also some resources that they have available. So, uh, Rob, take it away. Thank you so much, Jason. And on behalf of SAMHSA, thank you so much for including us today, and thank you to everyone for the hard work that you're doing during these difficult times. Perhaps we could advance to the next slide, Jason. Thank you. Um, my name is Rob Bailey. I'm a primary care physician and senior clinical advisor in SAMHSA. And today I'll be talking to you a little, a little bit about what we've found during the pandemic in regards to youth mental health um, during periods of isolation, and then briefly discuss some resources that SAMHSA has that might be able to help all of you, we hope, at some stage. Next slide, please. So as we know, um, schools are a place where um, individuals um, come and they spend a lot of time there. And aside from their home, there's no other setting that has more influence on a child's mental health and well-being. And schools are, of course, a place that provide daily opportunities for educators and other caring professionals to connect meaningfully with children and families to identify problems and offer support. That being said, all school officials are mandatory reporters for suspected abuse, and therefore they serve as a layer of protection for vulnerable and at-risk students who live in unsafe homes. Beyond this, school provides a level of connectedness and safety to, to children, and this is associated with lower levels of depressive symptoms, suicidal ideation, social anxiety, and sexual activity, as well as higher levels of self-esteem and more adaptive use of free time. Next slide, please. The school closures during the pandemic have had a profound effect on child abuse reporting, and we know this from various um, studies and analyses. We've seen, of course, that um, reports from the DC Family Child and Services Agency reflect a 62% decrease in child abuse reporting during the early part of the pandemic last year. And this was accompanied by more severe presentation of child abuse cases in emergency departments. Schools, to this end, provide a really important link to services for those individuals with mental health disorders and, of course, who suffer physical abuse. And of children 9 to 17 years old, it's estimated that approximately 21%, and that's over 14 million children, experience some type of mental health condition, but only 16% of these children uh, receive any type of treatment. Of this extremely small percentage of children receiving care, 70 to 80 percent re receive such care in a school setting, making schools really important and the loss of the school setting particularly impactful for many vulnerable students during the pandemic. Next slide, please. A person with uh, serious emotional disturbances is defined as an individual with mental, behavioral, or emotional conditions of sufficient duration resulting in function impairment which substantially interferes with or limits the child's role or functioning in family, school, or community activities. And we know that schools support these children and provide a lot of school-based services to them. One in 10 American children or adolescents are living with a serious emotional disturbance. And as I said, schools play an integral role in linkage to care and providing necessary supports. Next slide, please. Beyond this, educational attainment is really important, obviously, to children and their future. And research shows that school shutdowns caused by COVID-19 may create longitudinal achievement gaps. In particular, we've seen that among vulnerable or underserved students, there's an appreciable um, decline in, in uh, learning and possible engagement with education as well. One study of 800,000 students uh, from researchers at Brown and Harvard looked at how CERN, an online math program, was used before and after schools closed in March 2020. And data showed that um, though through the early part of the pandemic, student progress in math decreased by about half, and the negative impact was more pronounced in low-income zip codes. Next slide, please.
Delayed learning is a particular concern for low-income and minority students, and also those students with disabilities. The Centre on Reinventing Public Education, which is a think tank, released a report of pandemic learning policies of 477 school districts in the US, and it showed that only one-fifth of students have received uh, teaching over video, and that wealthy school districts were twice as likely to provide such teaching compared to low-income districts. When it comes to learning online or through video, students with disabilities uh, are a particular risk because they have more difficulty absorbing information via remote learning. And this is of particular importance to those students who are deaf, hard of hearing, have low vision or are blind, and those with learning disorders such as ADD or other physical or mental disabilities. Next slide, please. When it comes to providing assistance to the wonderful work that you do and the as a busy work that teachers do, SAMHSA provides a lot of backup. We have our grants program, of course, and this, this includes uh, grants such as the Healthy Transitions program that support mental issues among youth. And for more information about all of our grants and their availability and how to apply to them, you can find this online through samhsa.gov forward slash grants. And there are also the state mental health and substance use grants, um, and these grants can be um, distributed amongst state individual um, units or programs to provide um, for mental health care among youth. We also at SAMHSA produce numerous evidence-based practice guides, and these are available in our SAMHSA store. And the guides um, cover a variety of topics um, and provide a variety of information, including informational flyers, in-depth evidence-based practice guides, and also informational guides for parents and teachers alike. Um, next slide, please. The most um, pertinent link here is the treatment locator. The SAMHSA treatment locator provides um, a way to find local treatment um, centers and providers in areas that range from substance misuse um, to mental health concerns, youth mental health concerns. And so the treatment locator can be used to um, look for other services in, in particular locations and to read more about available services within a location. On the uh, left side of the screen here, you can see one of our new evidence-based resource guides. Um, and this guide looks at treatment considerations for youth and young adults with serious emotional disturbances and mental health illnesses with co-occurring substance use disorders. And this is an increasingly common issue we're seeing amongst youth. And this practice guide um, lists or summarizes the evidence around different treatment paradigms and provides supportive advice to those willing to offer treatment. Next slide, please. Oh, and that's me. I, uh, that's not me, but that, that's my talk. And um, I thank you for this opportunity to, to speak with you today. And I hand it back to Jason. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. And I know you're sticking around um, to answer some questions during the Q&A panel later. So um, folks, if you have questions for Robert, please put them into the chat. I'm actually just putting some links into the chat from SAMHSA, including um, a link to this guide um, that, that uh, was mentioned. And uh, I mean, Robert, a lot of us now through the pandemic have been uh, maybe shamefully so um, addicted to online shopping. But when you say the SAMHSA store, these are all free resources, right? Folks can just check those out um, for free. Yes, yes. They're, they're all available for free. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much um, for setting the stage and giving that really important context and resources. Um, so we're now very pleased to have uh, three sites um, from throughout the country share some um, innovative models and sort of promising practices, starting off with uh, sort of a a very quick take, but I think something that's very powerful um, from the Brighton Center in Covington, Kentucky. Uh, Brendan, take it away. Hi, Jason. Thank you for having me. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, great. Um, so my name is Brendan Goff. I work for uh, Brighton Center in Covington, Kentucky, and uh, I work in the neighborhood of City Heights here in Covington. And um, Brighton Center was contracted by the Housing Authority of Covington to oversee the, the Jobs Plus grants here in, um, in City Heights. And uh, when the grant first started, we got the community together um, and had them actually name the program. So it's called City Futures, uh, which again is what the, um, the name that the residents came up with. But um, 
One of the uh, activities that, that we put together, which took place this past Saturday, um, was to really focus on, um, you know, the mental health uh, for our youth. Um, and to give some context, the neighborhood of City Heights is a very uh, physically isolated uh, neighborhood here in Covington. And um, Robert just uh, spoke a bit about the effects that isolation can have on youth. Um, and it is a uh, neighborhood up on top of the hill in Covington with uh, one road in and out. And uh, that road is on a very steep hill. So it can be difficult for uh, youth to um, leave the neighborhood and participate in other activities. Um, and traditionally, their, uh, their outlet has been going to school and participating in after-school activities. Uh, so this past year has been particularly tough um, on the youth in this neighborhood. So uh, the event we had this past Saturday, we called the We Are Community Events. And we partnered with two other programs to make this happen. One was another Brighton Center program called Youth Leadership Development. So they work with uh, seventh graders through 12th graders to provide social emotional learning through various activities. And we also partnered with another uh, local organization called The Plug, who uh, does community uh, events based around art. So we had an event here in the neighborhood in the um, there's a basketball court, playground, kind of recreation area. And the plug provided us with uh, painting supplies, chalk, uh, just lots of different art supplies. And um, we provided a space for youth to be able to uh, work on individual art projects. We had a uh, chalk drawing contest, and then we did a community mural where everyone got to participate in, um, in a mural that is going to be hung up in one of the offices up here. And, and this event, and there's the picture of the mural that they created. Um, and this, this was a great event. We did uh, lots of outreach, partnering, of course, with uh, both programs. Um, we had a total of 26 youth that participated and a wide age range. It was from, I believe, five years old to about 17 years old uh, that came out. And uh, this mural in particular was pretty fun. It's on a uh, four by four sheet of plywood. And uh, to start off, the kids got to actually take water balloons filled with paint and throw them at, at this board to get this kind of like base layer of paint in the background. And then after that, I got to use spray paint and um, different things to, uh, to create this. And uh, underneath, we just taped We Are Community, so we were able to take that off when it was uh, wrapped up. Um, but the engagement in this activity was absolutely fantastic. Um, you know, all of the youth that showed up were, were so engaged and so excited to be there. and. Um, in particular, there were three young men, uh, about 13 years old, I believe, that um, uh, are kind of known in the community as kids who tend to act out a bit and are hard to kind of engage with. Um, and they showed up to the event and were probably the most engaged of anyone there. Um, they won one of the prizes in the chalk drawing contest uh, and won some um, art supplies that they immediately opened up and started creating even more art um, and were just so, so engaged with it. They even stopped their, their basketball game to come and, and participate. So, um, and uh, the Covington schools, the reason that we chose this past Saturday is the Covington schools start back at school uh, tomorrow, actually. And um, last week, right before this event, there was another back to school event in uh, City Heights where the youth got to get backpacks, collect school supplies, connect with um, their schools here in the neighborhood. And so it was really just uh, some combined efforts to try and um, get these youth ready for school, seeing as a lot of them haven't uh, been in person for, you know, almost a year and a half now. Um, so I will uh, pass it back to Jason. Great, thanks so much, Brendan. I mean, what a great idea. Um, and I know folks are um, sending in some questions about that. So um, yes, please please continue to do so. We're gonna have a Q&A &Q and panel discussion. Um, but I'm, I'm really 
pleased to hand it over next to the team from Norfolk, Virginia, um, to share a little bit about their youth mental health model that they know they've been doing in collaboration with the uh, Eastern Virginia Medical uh, School. So um, please take it away. Hi, Jason. Yep, you guys are on. Go ahead. All right, beautiful. Thanks a lot. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, I'm Julius Norman with Norfolk Redevelopment Housing Authority, the Client Services Youth Program uh, component. Uh, I'm happy that we're able to present some of the programs that we're actually doing using our youth mental health model. Uh, although we call it youth mental health models, we have a lot of programs that we utilize different strategies uh, from uh, career awareness strategies and our whole idea of our mental health and health strategy has been that we were looking at that as a way of creating what we call safer communities. Uh, so, as we begin to go through the slides, we'll look at some of the things that we've been doing here in Norfolk. So, you'll see a lot of programs uh, that actually uh, we use to kind of come back and provide what we call protective factors to the young people who are involved in our programming. And, uh, okay, you're doing the slides. Great. Uh, you can see the, job, the objectives that we have. Uh, our main thing when we look at these objectives, uh, it's interesting that the whole key was building healthy neighborhoods to create safer communities. And when we say that, we actually mean that what we try to do by getting young people involved in different programs, creating, creating those programs to help them be healthier, we find that these communities then begin to be safer. What we mean by that is, again, is that once we have people in the community who are working, when we have young people who are uh, thriving in school, parents are uh, actually supporting their kids in different activities, we find that that does reduce the crimes in our communities. So we do a lot of different things in helping uh, residents to gain access to resources and services. So we do promote healthy lifestyles and we actually encourage those changes by providing different programs, as you'll see on the next slide. Uh, our community health component and wellness, uh, you see a lot of different activities from Earth Day uh, to leadership uh, workshops and development. Uh, we hosted a vaccination clinic, uh, soccer camps, boxing camps. We try to provide a lot of different programs for our residents and particularly our youth that they can be involved in. Uh, during the pandemic, if you look at the last bullet, it said youth feeding programs. With that, we provided meals with our partnership with the food bank here in the city of Norfolk. And we provided those meals by going door to door. And that door to door led to be something instrumental in us creating programs to answer the need for young people who needed services. When we knocked on the doors delivering meals, we found that we were able to do our check-ins to find out what were the needs of our community, what, would, what did the family need, how are you doing, how are you doing in school. The interesting thing about that is that we would deliver these meals in the morning between the, the times of 9 and 11 o'clock. And if kids were coming to the door and they were asleep, we could check in, hey, why aren't you on, online in, in class or, or things like that. So by delivering and creating that youth feeding program, that gave us a great opportunity to check in on what the family needs were and exactly what the kids were doing. You'll see another bullet up there that talks about uh, mental health support groups. Uh, we actually run a lot of different programs and that mental health support group was created from a need that our groups, or young people who were participating in our program said that they wanted an opportunity where they could just literally talk to folks who could help them with different things that they may be going through that was non-judgmental and an opportunity for them to share some of the things that they, they needed in terms of their mental health. And our next slide. Uh, supported services. We offer programs from college exploration to scholarships, uh, uh, literature poster contests, some employment. All of our young people who are over the age of 16 had opportunities to 
uh, work into summer employment opportunities here in the summer in the, in the city of Norfolk, community service opportunities, uh, youth work experience for vocational training for for young people. Uh, these supportive services just didn't happen by uh, Norfolk Redevelopment Housing Authority, but it's a strong partnership that we have with the city of Norfolk, uh, the food bank, Crestar Health, uh, plenty of mental health facilities, and in terms of uh, EVMS, who's one of our large partners, Hampton Road Ventures. All of these supportive programs are actually with the help of other city entities that also have an investment in, my, in our youth in the city of Norfolk. And restorative activities, when you see the slide that has restorative activities, that was set up because of COVID-19, we were looking at a way to get our young people back into the, the feel of groove of getting back to what we would say uh, normal. Uh, we offered coping and relaxing uh, activities that actually had an opportunity that our kids would go to the beach and do meditation, empowerment walk at the Dismal Swamp, destruction room activities, dealing with anger management. Uh, all these activities were set up because we were very interested in helping our young people to move forward with their mental health. And that is it from this end. I have colleagues here. That, do you want to add anything, guys? We really appreciate that. We're going to get right into the Q&A and discussion, so hopefully um, we'll have members of your team kind of present their perspectives, um, particularly on the, on the course of those, those mental health workshops that you talked about and, and some of those restorative activities. So thank you so much. Um, you are welcome. And now, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, we have uh, Miriam from the Lynn Housing Authority uh, to talk about their Adulting 101 program. Uh, and again, if folks have um, questions, I'm already seeing some in the chat, so please keep sending those along. Miriam. Uh, thank you, Jason. Hi, everyone. My name is Mary Martinez, and I'm the financial coach here at Lynn Housing, um, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about our Adulting 101 workshop. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? Um, so a little bit about me. As I stated, my name is Mary Martinez, and I'm the financial coach. Um, I work with all programs in Lynn Housing and also just everywhere in the North Shore area, so anybody can send me referrals if they um, are in need of financial coaching, just because we know that... Um, like housing and finances kind of go hand in hand. Um, and working in the Lynn Housing Authority, we've kind of seen that um, we can help somebody get brick and mortar of a home, but um, if we also help them with their finances, then it's a lot more sustainable. Next uh, slide, please. So um, we, with partnering um, with the what's called the NSHAG, the North Shore Housing Action Group Program here at Lynn Housing, um, that specific program deal works with um, young adults. I'm so sorry if you hear construction. Um, but um, the NCHEC program um, helps um, youth from 18 to 24 years old that are experiencing um, homelessness or housing instability. Um, and they help anything from housing to like rack applications to um, like connecting them with a financial coach or any resources or mental health services. So I've partnered up with the NJAC program and we created what's called an Adulting 101 workshop, um, which was a lot of fun. Um, one of the reasons why we wanted to do um, an Adulting 101 is because I don't know about you guys, but being an adult is really hard and confusing. And especially with young adults who are 18 to 24, they have this mindset of like they don't, they might really not know who to go to or what questions to ask. And also there is an assumption that they already know everything, when in reality, if you're kind of doing like having housing instability or anything like that, you may not know a lot of things, right? You were kind of just thrusted into the situation um, and you kind of just have to figure it out on your own. So what we decided to do is kind of go back to the basics of adulting. And a lot of that is going to be with um, the five categories of like mental health um, and housing and finances, um, next steps, so like education um, and employment. So that's one of the reasons why we created this workshop, um, and which was pretty successful because a lot of the, the youth and young adults that came um, asked some really good questions. So we realized like, yes, they do have a lot of questions. They, they may not 
know some of the basics that we kind of just assume and place on young adults. Next slide. So the how. So um, this workshop was a three-day workshop, um, and we provided, we intentionally um, connected with students or part, um, community organization partners that are around Lynn specifically, because that's kind of our target audience. Um, and we connected with everybody, um, like outside sources and organizations, so people with mental health. Um, we connected with um, Mass Hire for Career Pathways. We connected with um, Salem State and North Shore to provide like education opportunities and talk, talk about like scholarships or like any next steps. We also um, connected with like youth, uh, youth build um, who helps with, like get them into G have their GED um, and and yeah we partnered specifically with people who like I wasn't the facil I was the, just a facilitator um, for the day but we were able to partner with people who are um, kind of expertise um, in that specific um, category. So again, in terms of mental health or career, we wanted um, all the youth to be able to be plugged in and know like, all right, in this community, these are the resources that I can go to and these are the other people um, that I can also ask questions if I need to, if need be. Next slide, please. Um, so again, partnering, um, partners and topics that were discussed is What is Mental Health by Emily Johnson. She's a case manager at Lynn Community Health Clinic. She did an amazing job about what, um, kind of as an adult, we wanted to make sure that kids are taking care of their well-being um, and their mental health and to connect them to resources uh, as such as like um, therapists or anything like that. A few of them had questions about like health insurance. Like these are all kind of adulting questions that even I myself like struggle with and I'm like I struggle with health insurance and all that fun concept. Um, we had Anna Campbell from the Lynn, um, who's the Lynn Community Service Director from JRI. She talked about self-advocacy. This was a really important one um, to kind of, again, show the young adults um, to advocate for themselves, to speak up, to ask questions, um, because they, we understand that they may not know it all, but we also don't know kind of what's going into their head. So um, asking questions in every environment, whether it comes to health or near doctors or even with us, like to ask good questions and not to just assume um, was super important and was um, even super impactful for myself. Um, for employment, we had the North Shore Youth Career um, from Mass Hire, um, and they talked about job employment and applying for jobs and what it looks like and just even practical tips of, um, of just retaining a job and what that would look like. Um, for finances, we had Scott Brogan from Primerica, and he um, talked about budgeting, and we kind of went over a mock budget of like, all right, if you're a young adult and you want to live alone, this is how much you're looking like, this is how much it's going to cost in terms of expenses and bills, um, and then this is how much it would look like if you were to have an hourly wage and things like that. So kind of helping them con connect the dots of, and looking more long term, which is really good. And then Merlinda Marcel from Elhan, she is the NCHEC, um case manager here at Lynn Housing, and she talked a lot about housing, kind of housing 101, about rent, um, about giving her them resources of like what it looks like to apply to the RAFT or, or um, ERAP or IRMA or anything like that, but also what it looks like, what it means to be like have a security deposit. We realize a lot of kids like, or not a lot of kids, even just adults in general don't realize that you should be getting back your security deposit and what that looks like. A lot of people just kind of don't realize that when they move, they are supposed to re require that back. So just having a lot of good foundational um, kind of 101 like practices as an adult, um, we kind of went over, which was a lot of fun. Next slide. And yeah, so this is the flyer. As I stated, it was an eight, uh, a three-day course. Um, everybody was super engaged, and it was just really helpful, um, again, to kind of go back to the basics. Um, because of the NSHAG program, there are already a lot of kids enrolled into that program, so the outreach was a little simple and easier um, because those are kind of the target um, youth that we were kind of thinking about. We are hoping to extend the Adulting 101 workshops um, to not only like just housing and stability, but also even for kids that are probably um, leaving, leaving high school, entering college, or even before that. Because um, yeah, everybody can kind of get a little uh, little help from like, oh, like these are the basics of like what healthcare is or what health insurance or what does um, mental health or wellness or anything like that look like. So, um, so yeah, it was all via Zoom. We provided 
um, gift cards for people who attended and asked great questions. Um, and there were also some providers that were also able to receive some resources. One of the, um, the biggest goals from the Adulting 101 that we wanted to accomplish was to um, have them lead with actionable steps. So if they spoke to somebody from like the mental health or wellness, there was an email that they, that they can reach out to that, that that person would connect them to any questions that they had about health insurance or about finding a therapist or what that looked like. So we wanted them always to have practical steps, what it looked like if you, they were interested in moving, um, what it looked like in terms of finances and things like that. We always wanted an actionable step um, during each of the workshop days, um, which was super important. Um, next slide, I think that's it. If I'm not mistaken. Yes, I think that's it. Um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun um, to have and it was just realizing vitally important for the youth to be informed, especially in kind of this crisis um, time of COVID. Um, again, I feel like if we assume that people know it all, then um, they'll miss a lot of the small and kind of important details. Um, and that was kind of our hope and our goal with the Adulting 101. Thanks so much. Thanks, um, I have. Thanks so much for yeah. everyone for listening. Jason, you can take it away. Of course. Thanks for all the presentations, and um, we've got about 20 minutes here for Q&A, so folks, please um, send in your questions uh, through the chat. We'll be helping to uh, moderate the Q&A. Um, just to kind of kick it off, and, and this is for everybody, um, you know, so I heard a lot of, you know, really innovative models, right, around um, sort of using art and community engagement, using this adulting 101 to engage with youth, and then, um, you know, sort of that partnership um, around mental health with the local uh, medical school. Uh, over the summer, which is wonderful. As we're now moving into the back to school, re really return to school and now folks, you know, heading back in person um, this year, you know, how are you all thinking about continuing or expanding these programs? How do you see these as being, you know, do these translate into after school activities? Are you planning weekend engagements? What's going to be your strategy during the school year to continue um, engaging with youth around mental health? And again, this is for any of the speakers or even Robert, if you have some, some thoughts or recommendations from sort of the um, SAMHSA level. And you may just be on mute if you're talking. Okay, well, while folks maybe think about that, we'll give our panelists a few minutes to, to kind of ponder that question. Um, let me ask uh, something else specifically. Uh, sounds like we have some, some questions on the phone. Uh, Michelle, is that right? Do we have some, some folks um, on the line who want to ask a question over the, over the phone? We do not currently have any questions on the phone, but I do want to remind folks, if you would like to ask a question via phone, please press pound on your telephone keypad and enter the question queue. Once again, pound two will enter you into the verbal question queue. Thanks, Michelle. So another question just for the panel or, you know, for Robert, um, if, if what you see from the federal level, you know, these are all great ideas. It sounds like, you know, it took some real thought and work to put together. Um, you know, sites may not really have, have started or have done much at this point but are thinking about it. So what does it really take to kind of implement something like this. I heard a lot of great work that has been done in the past to build, you know, connections and community to so that, that these things could be successful. But if folks were to start today, what would you recommend as sort of a first step to try and um, do activities like this? Um, I can probably answer this one. Um, so this is Miriam from Lynn Housing. So to start the financial coaching work, uh, not the financial, the adulting 101 workshop, um, it was vitally important for us to connect with other um, agencies and organizations that we um, like know of and connect with or even that we were somewhat unfamiliar with. Um, it was very odd for me but to send like an email blast to a bunch of organizations to see anybody that was interested. Um, it was vitally important for us to realize that, hey, we are not the experts in everything and that's okay. We don't need to be. Um, but partnering with others that are around this community was super beautiful and, and nice to see. Um, and yeah, it was just, it was kind of an introductory email and kind of a blast. Um, and because of 
kind of COVID, everybody is able, is a lot more like digitally savvy. So um, we were able to have meetings and kind of like I was able to connect with a lot of different providers um, and work kind of alongside of them and um, networking, um, which was awesome. Um, and also super helpful for any of my future clients because now I have a better connection with people that are in organizations and other providers. Um, so that it, it feels like super elementary and basic, um, but also for me personally, because I'm kind of an introvert, it was um, super helpful um, to kind of get out of the shell and just send out an email blast to a bunch of agencies saying, hey, who's, who would be interested in um, presenting and speaking um, given the opportunity? And yeah, it was, it was really interesting and really beautiful to see like the community kind of come together and saying, oh, like we're all a part of this and we do want to help the youth and give them information and resources and make sure that like they're all plugged in. Right. Yeah, it sounds like partnership um, certainly a key component to this, right? Like we, we don't all have to be um, experts, right, at mental health certainly, um, but, but there are folks out there at the state and local level. Robert, can you talk just a little bit? I know SAMHSA supports, um, you know, departments of mental health and other um, sort of entities like that. You know, who should folks look for if they're not already working with like a health partner or a mental health partner? That's a really good question, and I think, um, just just looking at the community is really important. Um, so looking at who is around you, what services they offer, um, and coordinating with them, as, as was suggested earlier, um, is essential for making those early linkages. And then federal agencies like SAMHSA are really good at, at looking at the, the broader uh, treatment landscape. So at SAMHSA, we're very much focused on substance abuse and mental health issues. And so the treatment locate the treatment locator is very helpful because it um, allows you to enter a zip code and then you can find um, different resources related to whatever question you have. So looking at sort of mental health resources uh, explicitly, you can find them on the treatment locator and you can certainly talk to those individuals, create linkages um, and treatment providers are, are really keen to provide treatment across different modalities, so not just in the office couch-based treatments, but as has been discussed today, all the wonderful art therapy options, um, engaging youth in different activities, all those things represent really important treatment paradigms. And so treatment providers that SAMHSA knows of, um, which is many, 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 um, really, really love engaging in those different types of, of strategies. So I think if your community is, is looking to make linkages, I would recommend having a look around the, your local area first, seeing what's out there, talking to people you find. But then if, if you want a, a broader perspective, then looking at the SAMHSA treatment locator can help you find specific individuals. And then should you want to better understand some evidence-based programs, um, we also have resources in our, in our SAMHSA store, which of course are free and uh, downloadable to anyone. So those resources include uh, flyers, information, uh, pamphlets, sort of very technical science-based guides and uh, a whole bunch of other resources and references too. Um, I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And I think, you know, it sounds like folks could probably use that treatment locator that we pasted into the chat, of course, to locate treatment options um, for folks, not just um, limited to youth in that community, but also potential partnerships um, in addition to, you know, checking out some of the other resources there. So, so thank you. Um, other folks want to weigh in either on either of these questions around sort of how to get started and, and build those partnerships and then sort of what, what, the, what your thinking and plan is for um, kind of continuing this work in the, in the back to school, return to school, and then, in, you know, throughout the school year. And again, if any of the sites are talking, you just may be on mute, so just check that. All right, well, let me ask another question while folks are considering. Um, again, please uh, continue sending some, some things in through the chat. Um, there's a question about youth listening sessions. So have you all sort of, um, you know, done like a focus group or listening session with youth? You know, how do you really get to understand, um, you know, the concerns and, and what's going on out there?
Hi, Jason. Yeah, go ahead. This is Julius from Norfolk. Um, when, when I hear you talking about the listening sessions, well, here in Norfolk, we had uh, existing groups uh, uh, of young people that were between the ages of uh, 16 to 24 who were going through uh, employment opportunities, trainings, and they had a lot of uh, concerns. So what we did was link up with a mental health facility that allowed the young people just to come in and talk. Uh, it was kind of one of those things that were created just because young people had a need that they said that they wanted someone to talk to. So we had plenty of mental health partners here in the city of Norfolk, and they were more than willing to provide those particular services or just to partner with us just to see if they can listen to different concerns. So it wasn't anything that was planned by us, but it was just a need that the young people said that they just wanted opportunities to create a group and have people who had like experiences or or concerns that could come together and just talk about what their concerns were. So, oh, that's wonderful. Um, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, other folks? Hey, Jason, this is Brendan from Covington. Um, as far as like listening sessions and that kind of thing, our the work with our program with uh, in City Heights here, we really try to let our progression with the program be driven by um, the voices of the residents. Uh, so we try and uh, really bake in feedback into both into the events that we're doing and have individual feedback sessions um, because, of course, we want to provide events and activities and services that the residents want more so than what we might think they want, if that makes sense. So a lot of times with our events we'll have, we might have surveys or just have, you know, kind of Q&As at the end to get feedback from residents and see, hey, is this the kind of event you want to see? Is there anything else you would like? Those kinds of things so that we can really use that information directly from them to uh, to drive the work forward, and that kind of those kinds of feedback sessions are a big part of what drove our um, most recently our community events. Um, and as I mentioned before, that's how we actually got the name of the program, um, and it seems to work pretty well for us for the most part. Great. No, I appreciate that. It sounds like the feedback session is sort of that engagement loop. Um, you know, it, it's not just coming into this as like a um, as a, as a one-off, but but it shows that you all are really dedicated. Um, so uh, another question, um, this one actually is um, about the mask mandate and um, around, you know, parents. Um, so, you know, how are you kind of looking at, so not just with masks, but I'll broaden the question, even with vaccines, right? We know that parents and children and youth don't always um, have the same outlook on things, right? They may have different opinions about masking or vaccinating or just taking safety measures and precautions because of the pandemic. Are you all looking at any of the work that you're doing as a two-gen approach, so to reach the parents, you know, through the children or vice versa? And um, you know, if so, do you have any suggestions or um, maybe just, you know, um, lessons learned about doing that? And I'll even say, I mean, obviously we know a lot of parents have mental health concerns, right? So are you are you sort of using any of these strategies um, to engage with parents or to offer resources to parents or, or adults as well? Um, you know, just how are you looking at sort of the, um, the two-gen approach? You may be muted again if you're talking. Once again, if anybody would like to ask a question over the phone, please press pound two on your telephone keypad to enter the question queue. All right, we'll give our sites a few moments to kind of think that over. Um, and in terms of another question, um, in terms of mental health and um, youth engagement, um, are you doing any sort of vaccine outreach as part of that? Um, you know, obviously isolation has been a big part of 
um, what you know, youth and everyone has experienced over the past year and a half. Are you doing anything to encourage youth 12 and up to, to get vaccinated so that they'll, you know, they can return to school and, in some sense, return to normal? And if so, it sounds like another part of that question was, you know, how do you deal with consent concerns, uh, whether I guess it's about, you know, engaging with youth on mental health, you know, to make sure that the parents are comfortable. Can anyone talk to sort of what they do around ensuring that they have, um, you know, consent and that they have conversations with the parents to, to make sure that they're comfortable? Hi, this is Rob from SAMHSA. Um, I think in terms of mask mandates and vaccine outreach, um, from a mental health perspective, it's really important to have those frank and honest conversations, um, which we've seen in some parts of the country do uh, degenerate into, into real arguments. Um, certainly for children, they're in this difficult bind because they often know how their parents feel about vaccines um, and see this in contrast to, to general mandates across states. And so, um, having, having those frank discussions in different environments in a non-threatening manner, so not trying to enforce any particular view uh, within the schools on a, on a child, but understanding where they come from and thus understanding potentially their parents' perspectives is a useful way to, for schools and, and housing authorities to particularly understand the positions of their constituents and potentially create targeted strategies around um, encouraging mask use and vaccine uptake within schools. Great, yeah, thank you for that perspective. Other folks want to share maybe what you're seeing on the ground in terms of that? Okay, let me ask another question in through the chat. Uh, we just have a couple more minutes here before we wrap up, so um, I'll give also all the panelists sort of a chance to maybe address all these questions to just a final round and last thoughts. But um, question around social media and how you're using social media to engage with youth, um, if anyone wants to speak to that. Hey, Jason, this is Brendan from Covington. Um, hey, we uh, put a lot of effort into our social media. Um, right now it's Facebook and Instagram. Um, and Instagram is really uh, what we use to try and engage the younger, um, you know, portion of our demographic. And both we really just try to keep very regular um, and varying content on. Um, and what really seems to be the most popular is um, content that uh, like engages the community. So uh, one of our recent posts was about the event we did on Saturday and there's, you know, pictures of the kids painting and staff painting with the kids and doing the chalk contest and all that. And um, we get a lot of engagement with posts like that. We do um, success stories for uh, residents. Maybe they uh, completed school or they got their, you know, their dream job, that kind of thing, and we'll do um, success stories for them, and that, that has a lot of engagement. Um, but also we use it as a way to keep the community up to date with um, events that we have going on, and we have, uh, we have a good relationship with the president and the vice president of the community council here, and they uh, share pretty much all of our posts on their, uh, you know, personal Facebook pages that have that much broader of a reach throughout the community. Um, and we do see a lot of residents saying, oh, yeah, I came to this event because I saw something about it on Facebook or, you know, my, my son saw something on Instagram about it. Um, and we've been slowly but consistently growing um, our following and our engagement. I hope that's helpful. Great. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, folks um, like me who maybe knew of Instagram from, from a while back, uh, you know, sort of shocking for me to learn that it's now sort of a social media platform integrated with Facebook. Um, but, you know, uh, I think it's a rapidly evolving space. Uh, you know, TikTok I know was really big a couple years ago, and, and now my father's on it. So, you know, it, there's always a new platform, right? Um, so uh, glad to hear that Instagram is sort of the way that you all are doing that. I'm, I'm sure folks have different platforms that they're using. 
Um, so I know we're about to wrap up here. Uh, I just want to give everybody a quick 30 seconds. You know, key takeaway, um, any leave behinds you want to share for participants um, from your experiences and um, anything else you want to share. We can start, Robert, with you. Thank you, Jason. Um, I, I think the, the, the main thing I'd like to share is that this, this period of time has been hard on, on youth. It's been hard on everyone, really. And so um, when those people return back to school, it's really important to have discussions around how people coped during COVID-19, how they're feeling, um, strategies to help improve a sense of security within schools as well. And I know that both is a, a real burden on teachers and administrators but I think from a mental health perspective, it can really help uh, reset the agenda. It can really help um, make children feel listened to and heard, and it can help um, teachers and administrators better understand potentially how they can cater to the needs of their students. Um, above all, thank you to, for, for the work you do and the work um, that everyone else on the call does as well. It's, it's wonderful to hear these incredible stories and, and and all these activities that have been done. So thank you for including me today. Thank you. Um, and, and maybe really quickly, um, if we could just have, um, go down from our presenter order. Um, Brennan, if you want to share any last thoughts. Yeah, definitely. Um, the Really for us here in City Heights, the, the most important thing is really just, uh, you know, engaging these youth being a, a positive uh, influence in their lives and knowing that, um, that they have a safe space in their community. We, we put a lot of effort into making sure that our office is a safe space for anyone and everyone who needs it. And, um, you know, youth know that they can come in if they're having a hard day, they have something they need to talk about, they know that they can come in here. And that's, um, that's, that's very, very important for us so that if nowhere else, then at the very least they do have a safe space here. Um, and that's really, you know, kind of the building blocks for uh, progressing into the, the next stages of, of addressing, you know, mental health is just building that relationship and creating that safe space. Um, yeah, and thank you to, to everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, the team from Norfolk, you all want to share? Uh, just continue to say, uh, to continue to listen to what our young folk are, are saying, uh, to provide um, some answers or opportunities so they continue to grow continue partnerships that we have here in the city of Norfolk so that we can provide answers and opportunities for young people to continue to grow and save up in those opportunities to make sure that they're safe. Uh, that's basically it for us. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Miriam? Yeah, kind of what everybody, um, just echoing what everybody stated already in terms of um, kind of being an open space for youth and young adults um, to come in, um, having good, like, having them be able to ask good questions and just not assuming that they understand or know it all because as an adult, we don't know it all. So um, just providing a safe space, but also um, a place for them to share, um, especially during these hard times. Um, and yeah, and just kind of building that community and partnership with others. Well, thanks so much. Um, and thanks to everyone for attending today. Um, please join us next Wednesday. Uh, this is, as Jamie mentioned at the outset, uh, one of our three uh, hot shots for sort of uh, pre-Labor Day, uh, wrapping up this summer. Um, next week, we're gonna talk about Delta. I'm sure everybody's been hearing about the Delta variant. Uh, as Jamie mentioned, even this morning, there's some news that the CDC is gonna be authorizing a third dose um, for folks who receive the mRNA vaccine, that's the Pfizer and Moderna. So we're gonna do a deep dive next week and talk about you know, why are we experiencing this resurgence with Delta? Well, what's different about it? Um, you can see there from the graphic that, of course, it's more transmissible, so that's one issue. But what else is, is going on with this, and how are we going to get to the end of the pandemic, um, keeping in mind uh, you know, the, the variants that we don't even know are yet to come? Uh, so please tune in next week. You can, again, uh, sign up for our bulletins. All the registration links are there, and uh, we'll provide those also in the follow-up um, from this presentation for those who attended today. And uh, just another plug for September 1st, building off of today's um, presentation, we invite you to join us for our Jab It Up initiative on youth vaccination. This is in partnership with the CDC. They're launching their little jab book, which is a um, set of tools, resources, and strategies for increasing youth vaccination. Um, they're really the experts in this space. Uh, we're very happy to be able to share this with you. Um, and so please do tune in if you want to hear straight from the CDC 
you know, what, what we should be doing around youth vaccination. As Jamie mentioned, you know, that's really where the numbers are lagging, and it's also where infections right now are um, disproportionately um, located in youth populations. So uh, please do tune in September 1st. Uh, we know you all are doing a lot of great work to support your communities in the return to school, um, you know, just throughout the pandemic, and we appreciate all of you taking the time to join us today for this very important topic on youth mental health. So I uh, look forward to seeing you at our uh, future Hot Shots, and uh, again, please sign up for the bulletin. But thank you so much for joining us, and uh, take care and be safe.